Money be me, oh 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 money be me, 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 Oh 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 money be
Noch ein Druider. <lacht> ja, ja. Teuer. So, a uh, quick announcement for some languages, uh, frequency, radio frequencies for some languages. French 96, Spanish 90.5, Thai 105.5, Russian 98.5, German 103. So, I repeat, French 96, Spanish 90.5, Thai 105.5. Russian 98.5 and German 103. So for English translation, tune your radios to frequency 96, FM radio frequency 96, please. Yeah. <laughs> 
Nå ja. Så det er næst. So we will not do have any recitation of prayers. So we, maybe we all know, know this verse. I pay homage to the Gotama who taught out of his compassion the sacred dharma to uh, rid us of all distorted views. And then next is the salutation to the mother of all the Buddhas, the Pratyaparamita, which is ineffable, inconceivable, inexpressible, and uh, which is the domain of self-aware wisdom. Oh, yeah. And then the mantra of Heart Sutra, that yatha gati gati para gati para sang gati bodhiswaha. So for the past uh, many years, mainly um, for these Tibetan students, youth, um, we have set this time of the year for, uh, because the students from other schools, from other places also could attend this and so uh, teaching, and therefore the main uh, disciple or the uh, recipients of this teaching are those of the uh, school children. And then we ha also have this time here, a group of Thai uh, Buddhist um, monastics and others. And so Buddha, after becoming enlightened over 2,500 years ago, after his enlightenment, he first gave the three, the sermon on the Four Noble Truths, which teach the, the, the Four Noble Truths and the 16 characteristics, uh, which are the fundamentals to the teaching of the Buddha. And then, with regard to the perf perfection of wisdom teachings, discourses, the Buddha taught it in um, that of the uh, Gritakuti, the Vulture Peak, and so the Four Noble Truths was given uh, and taught in Varanasi. And so we here we have the Theravada followers of the Theravada tradition, and I respect you because you are the senior students of the Buddha. So with regard to the monastic discipline, the practice of monastic discipline, there are different orders of Vinaya, and so, the Theravada tradition follow uh, Vinaya in uh, uh, the Pali language, whereas in Tibet, we follow the Prati Moksha, uh, which, was, which is in, uh, basically in Sanskrit. So it's mainly contained in the Sanskrit. Uh, so there are a few differences in uh, numbers of uh, certain uh, misdeeds, I mean, the, the, the infractions and so forth. So with regard to the misdeeds, what are called misdeeds, there are five sets of uh, infractions. So in Pali there are 70 or 75 something. With regard to the minor misdeeds, so there are the difference is only minor between the Vinaya uh, that is followed in the uh, Theravada tradition in Pali to, uh, tradition and uh, in uh, that of the Sanskrit. For example, in Pali uh, tradition, the Theravada tradition, you mention only one uh, uh, precept about how to wear the uh, robes, monks' robes. And it says that you should wear it 
properly. Whereas in the Mulasar Vastivada tradition that we follow, the Vinaya says that there are seven uh, n uh, aspects in which it should be worn. Not too low, be uh, the, going below the ankle, not too high, going above the knee and so forth. And so with regards to the uh, Vinaya, the monastic discipline and others, uh, these are foundation to, uh, and we share, uh, I mean the, the, the Theravada and the Sanskrit tradition share in these, whereas the Pranjapalami, uh, that the perfection and wisdom teachings are um, separate. And so I uh, really appreciate the Thai monks and uh, the Thai followers of the Theravada tradition who have come here, especially uh, for this teaching. So there has been very little contact between us, the followers of the Pali and Sanskrit traditions. So I've been encouraging, urging that we should strengthen this, um, uh, increase the contact between us. So we are actually doing something. In the 60s, I actually sent some Tibetan monks to Thailand and they stayed in a, mo a monastery in Thailand and they also took the uh, Theravada to, uh, monastic vows as well and so there were four or five of them but we could not continue sending the monks uh, to Thailand and after that and so I met some uh, Thai people recently and so they were talking about having three monks over here, and we the, and also sending Tibetan uh, three monks, uh, three Tibetan monks to Thailand, so that they could actually, um, in order to strengthen our uh, contact bond, um, they could learn the language first of each other, and. Then here there are people from many different countries, other countries. So there are people from, uh, for example, ch regarding China, uh, it is a traditionally a Buddhist country and particularly following the Nalanda tradition, as I said before, and then Vietnam. Uh, Korea, Japan, they also followed the Sanskrit tradition uh, which was uh, which spread from these uh, from China into these countries and then the Buddhism that has spread in Tibet so we all follow the same t Sanskrit tradition and also uh, the Mongolites uh, such as uh, Mongolia, people in Mongolia, and then the three republics in the Russian Federation. So we follow the same tradition, the Sanskrit Nalanda tradition. So these are the traditionally uh, Buddhist uh, followers of Buddhism. So since the uh, means of communication has actually become very um, prevalent these days, um, there had been a new uh, growing interest in Buddhism. And so people who were not traditionally Buddhists uh, do come to these kind of teachings. And so for you, Though you were not traditionally Buddhists, you have no contact, you had no contact with Buddhism in, in the past, but you take interest in the teaching of the Buddha. And particularly, it is important for you to um, uh, see the, that uh, Buddhist philosophy is quite different from others' uh, religious traditions. 
So there are many different religious traditions, such as in India, the homegrown religions like Sankhya and so forth, Jainism, and then Buddhism also. And then in the Middle East, the major world religions such as Christianity, Judaism, and Islam developed in, these, uh, in the Middle East. And all these religions teach the message of um, altruism. All, all of them teach love and compassion. So, so though the religions teach this, whereas the followers themselves make division amongst the different religious followers, saying it's my religion, our religion, and that's their religion and so forth. And so all religions essentially teach the same message of love and compassion. So of course there, were, there are maybe primitive religions which are like shamanism, uh, worshipping nature, spirits and so forth, uh, whereas uh, these major religious traditions of the world teach love, compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, self-discipline and contentment. These are shared messages of all the major religious traditions. So, in other words, all these religions, religious traditions have helped humanity for thousands of years now. And today also they are benefiting millions of beings and uh, they will benefit people in the future as well. And therefore, saying my religion and our religion and their religion and causing division, there's no need to do that. So we should respect in order to develop harmony amongst the religious traditions, whereas we should make a distinction between respect and faith. We should respect all religious traditions, whereas with regard to faith, you keep faith in your own religion. It is therefore important with respect to have harmony amongst religions. Is it possible to have this? Of course, yes. If you look at the India, India is an example of um, uh, the uh, religious harmony. All the major religious traditions coexist harmoniously in India. So in this huge nation of India, if it is possible that religious tradition is, um, I mean, uh, uh, could be practiced in uh, religious harmony, it could be practiced in this land, then it is possible, for, it uh, should be possible for the rest of the world to follow this example. So I um, say that with respect to the teaching of love, compassion and so forth, all religions teach that. Therefore, we have reason to respect all religious traditions. Whereas in philosophical field, we can divide the religions into theistic, those religions believing in the creator God and those do, that do not. So in India, for example, we have the non-theistic religions, such as non-theistic Sankhya school, Jainism and Buddhism, according to which there is no beginning of life. Though there's no beginning to life, there is this assertion of an independent soul in uh, the uh, uh, other religious traditions, so Sankhya and uh, uh, Jainism and Buddhism do not uh, assert the beginning or uh, do not assert Creator God as such. Whereas other religious traditions do believe and assert that of Creator God. So. In India, the non-theistic Sankhya, Jainism and Buddhism 
are the ones that do, do not believe in an, uh, a creator god, whereas um, apart from Buddhism, the other two uh, does, uh, do assert that of an independent self whereas uh, or soul or Atman theory, whereas Buddhism does not. It is said uh, that um, there is no self ap apart from the, uh, the psychophysical aggregates. On the basis of the psychophysical aggregates, a person or a being is designated according to Buddhism. Therefore, there is no independent self as such. So within Buddhism, I mean, uh, there, are, um, uh, the, there are these different philosophical traditions, the schools. Some assert selflessness of persons or personal selflessness, whereas the, uh, the, the, they do not assert that of selflessness of phenomena. So of course, we naturally or instinctively have this sense of an I, I am this, I am that. So because of this, uh, holding on to this kind of view that there is an uh, some kind of independent or um, uh, a, a permanent And so uh, but this, uh, the uh, philosophical schools of Buddhism teach that not only it is the case that the self which is permanent, single and autonomous uh, does exist, uh, which is the view of non-Buddhist schools. Um, and also um, what they um, assert is that uh, there is no self which is like a ruler over the psychophysical aggregates. And so they assert that of selflessness in the sense of um, the lack of or absence of and substantially existent, um, self-sufficiently um, existent uh, uh, self. So whereas the Chittamatras and uh, Madhyamakas do assert on top of selflessness of persons, uh, the selflessness of phenomena as well. So, so when they use the logic to actually demonstrate or prove that of selflessness of phenomena, they uh, use different logics. Whereas in the case of Chittamatras, they uh, actually use logic to prove that there's no externality to anything. External phenomena does, no, uh, does not exist. So, which is quite similar to what quantum physicists say these days. So, quantum physicists say that there's nothing objectively existing. And so, so although things do appear to have some external existence, they do not have that existence, external existence. And the reasoning that uh, the Chittamatras give uh, is because the object and this, the, the subjective awareness which perceives it are seen simultaneously arising, uh, therefore the, there is no external object. And the, 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 the object and the subjective uh, perception are not different essentially. And so what the Chittamatras use to reject the externality of things is quite similar to the quantum physicist's idea of saying there's no objective existence. And so for the Chittamatras, the existence, uh, form and so forth are because of the, uh, the uh, they are the reflections of the perception which perceive them. And therefore, they talk about non-duality of uh, subject and object. And so they have really given uh, serious thoughts to these, to say this. And then within the Madhyamaka philosophy, uh, there are Madhyamaka followers who, on the one hand, assert what the Chittamatras assert, that there is no externality to phenomena, whereas they also assert that there is no true um, uh, existence in things as well. 
So they are the, the Madhyamakas who assert the objective existence, objective or um, the self-characterized uh, phenomena. So they really, the, if you, uh, I mean, these philosophical schools have given serious thoughts to the uh, nature of things. Whereas the ultimate view of um, the uh, emptiness is uh, the what is um, explained by Master Nagarjuna. So, Master Nagarjuna's tradition has no internal uh, contradiction whatsoever. So, what is the purpose of these philosophical ideas? Are they to confuse people or what? <laughs> That's not the case. Because, and uh, the, the reason is because because of our self-grasping, grasping at some independent self, I mean, it actually creates that of exaggerated view, which gives rise to negative emotions, these destructive emotions, which in turn cause suffering to us. So in order to get rid of this grasping at the self, independent self, I and mean, then this uh, philosophical view of emptiness is taught. So some scientists even say that the mind which actually sees that there is some kind of a appearance of things as if they have some independent existence. So um, some scientists even say that, uh, the quantum physicists say that um, if you are fully convinced and um, fully convinced that there is no objective existence in things, then that helps to actually reduce your reaction towards things um, and uh, seeing things in to uh, complete um, um, black and white. And, uh, and Master Nagarjuna says, uh, by elimination, through the elimination of karma and delusions, um, there is liberation and karma and delusion arise through conceptual constructs and these in turn are rooted in this grasping at true existence and this is uh, ended by uh, that of the wisdom of emptiness. So the view of emptiness is to reduce this uh, grasping at some kind of a solidity in things. So because we have this uh, uh, the clinging to some kind of a, a solidity in things, then there is the grasping and uh, then you have uh, attachment to it and uh, when you have attachment that also when you when you find some kind of obstacle that is being caused to what you are attached to then you uh, grow angry so in today's world people abuse other people and deceive others and also kill other human beings. So in our childhood, we don't have this desire to kill others. And there's no sense of discrimination um, uh, saying my side and other side and so forth. So some scientists even they're not talking in religious terms, but they, through their experiment and research, they, uh, they say that the basic human nature is compassionate. So in, in one of our science meetings, scientific meetings, one of the scientists actually said that the basic human nature is compassionate. And the evidence to, for this they gave is that if you have a child a pre-verbal um, a child, a few months old. So these infants have not yet developed language. So very young infants.
So they showed some um, animations in which uh, they showed that uh, at, in the animation, some uh, children affectionately helping one another. And that animation was shown to the infant child. And the infant child actually showed um, joy in seeing one child helping another in the, uh, in the animation. So this child, this infant, was very uh, happy. And then the second animation showed that there were two children who were actually uh, harming one another. For example, uh, it actually showed one child pushing a ball uphill. So in the first animation, when the child was having some difficulty pushing the ball uphill, another child comes and helps push the ball uphill, and they were successful. And then the infant was very happy. The reaction from the infant was happiness, joy. Whereas the second animation shows that this one first child, while trying to push the ball uphill and having difficulty, another child comes from the opposite side and actually pushes it down on him. And that, when that was shown to the infant child, this pre-verbal child, um, the, the child was actually, uh, the reaction from the child was negative. And so, even at that age, pre-language, the infant reacted in two different ways to these two uh, animations. One showing joy and happiness, the, in the other uh, showing a negative attitude or expression. And so this shows, the, according to the signs, that the basic human nature is um, compassionate. And so if you are compassionate, altruistic, then you will be peaceful, relaxed, and because of that, you'll have more friends. Whereas if you are suspicious, doubtful of others and so forth, then if you remain like that, you won't have friends. And in the end, you'll be left alone. You will be lonely. And so this is also this, this case with the dogs and cats. So some dogs, when they see other dogs around them, I mean, they, they, uh, the hair on their body, on their back, stands on end. Um, whereas some, uh, uh, dogs, which are very friendly with other dogs, live very uh, peacefully. So as long as we are social animals, if you are more friendly with the others whom you rely on, you are dependent on, you are happier. And if you remain alone and lonely, you are unhappy. This is very clear from our experience. And then the medical scientists also say that if you have constant, if you are constantly angry and anxious, uh, fearful and so forth, the, uh, it actually harms your immune system it weakens your immune system. So um, they say this, whereas if you are compassionate and if you are relaxed, then the immune system also is not weakened. Therefore, the basic human nature is compassionate, which is very precious. And then the important thing is to educate people because we have this marvelous intelligence, this brain, whereas the sensorial perceptions regarding smell, sight, sound, and so forth, other animals like um, a rabbit may have more acute uh, uh, auditory perception than us. So with regard to the sensorial, uh, sensory perceptions, the animals may, be, um, may have more acute senses than us. Whereas we as human beings have this ability to think. 
more critically to investigate into the nature of things and so forth. So our brain is um, better at, at that than the animals. And then we, the human beings also developed a language and then uh, the religious traditions also developed because of uh, human beings using our intelligence. So what is important for us is to use this intelligence in order to uh, advance or strengthen our basic human nature that is compassion. So therefore, everywhere in the world, education is considered very important. So everyone is actually paying attention to educate people. Whereas the so-called modern education, the existing modern education is um, uh, uh, more uh, directed towards material development. But why are we facing so many difficulties and problems in the world today? Although we talk about peace, I mean, it's not achieved because we use this marvelous human mind or intelligence um, merely for uh, material development and not use it to promote this compassionate nature. So the basic human quality of love and compassion, which is very alive and fresh in our childhood, um, uh, became, becomes dormant as we grow up and go through school systems. And therefore, I say that, uh, and many, or many educationists, also educators and educationists, also say that um, the, the current existing uh, school system, educational system, is not adequate. So what we need to, to do is the, uh, the education should be used to promote the basic human um, positive quality of love and compassion. So we have the facility or the condition for that. And so for the Tibetan students, and thanks to the past uh, Tibetan uh, Dharma emperors, the Nalanda Monastic University tradition of Buddhism was established in Tibet and Master Shanda Rakshita, the great master uh, abbot, was a great scholar himself and also um, um, you, can, you can actually uh, witness his scholarship through his writings of Madhyamaka text as well as uh, text on logic and epistemology. So, he introduced the Buddhism, the Nalanda tradition in, Buddhism, in Tibet, and Master Padmasambhava mainly took the responsibility to overcome the obstacles, the resistance to the spread of Buddhism in Tibet. And then the Master Shandarakshita took the main responsibility to uh, translate the texts from Sanskrit into Tibetan and the Tibetan uh, language was not that rich but the new words were coined as the new words were coined while the translations were undertaken you can actually see in, our, in the translations um, uh, Tibetan translations of the uh, Indian texts that uh, uh, there is mention of uh, the uh, translator and the uh, so master Jnana uh, Deva. So Bandapensik and Jnana Deva, the Indian master, and the Tibetan translator Bandapensik translated this book, the Bodhisattva Charya Avatara. And then later, it was also translated by Shakya Lodu. Mm. 
So in the colophon, it says this concludes the, uh, the um, Bodhisattva Charya Avatar, the uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, composed by Shanti Deva and so forth. And it was translated from the Sanskrit into Tibetan and edited and settled upon by the Kashmiri edition, um, from a Kashmiri edition by the Indian scholar Sarva Yadeva and the editor translator Mang Pelsek. And then later it was uh, translated, uh, also uh, retranslated and settled upon by the Indian uh, scholar Dharma Sri Badra and the editor translator Mang Rinchen Sangpo and Shaja Lotu, and finalized by Sherap, uh, Loden Sherap in the end, um, with the help of Sumati Kirti. And so, the earlier this, some of the students uh, debated and um, and when we debate, we use a certain style of language uh, where we say um, um, it follows that and, so, and, and also because it is so and so forth. So these um, uh, patterns of debating were uh, actually uh, come from the Indian Nalanda Master's text, like Dhammakiti's text on logic and so forth. And then uh, Indian uh, other Tibetan masters like uh, uh, Shant, uh, the master Sakya Pandita and also Sab Chaba Chöje, um, the Kadam master Chaba Chöje may have uh, um, uh, may be credited with the debating procedure that we use in Tibet. And so because of using logic in um, proving and establishing the, me, the, the teaching of the Buddha uh, without actually relying only on uh, scriptural quotations which we follow in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, so uh, which actually follows the statement of the Buddha himself who says, O oh, monks and scholars, just as a gold is tested by rubbing, cutting and burning, likewise you should examine my teaching and then accept it, not because you have, de you, uh, you have faith or devotion to me. So he says that to his followers that they should actually check his teaching, investigate and experiment the teaching. And when you are able to verify the truth of the, his teaching, then the, the students should accept the teaching. And therefore, the masters of India, like uh, of Nalanda tradition, uh, like Nagarjuna and his uh, disciples, have said that certain teachings of the Buddha which actually do not uh, uh, stand to the test of reason, uh, cannot be taken literally. Whereas there are certain teachings like the, uh, those sutras which teach the three, what are known as the three swabhava, three, uh, three natures, um, could actually be contradicted by reason if you take them literally. And therefore, within the same te uh, teaching of the same teacher, and although um, the certain teachings like the Prajaparamita, uh, if you t actually take uh, them literally, there's no logical contradiction in it. Whereas uh, other teachings, if you take them literally, you would actually um, face logical contradictions. So uh, what this shows is that the emphasis is on reason. And therefore, on the basis of reasoning, you make the distinction between the provisional teachings, which cannot be taken literally, and on the face value of the te uh, teachings, whereas the, uh, you, can, uh, you, you, you could also uh, have certain teachings which are definitive, that can be taken on face value of the teachings. 
such as the examples of the Panchaparamita teachings, and then the, uh, for the second one, there's uh, those of the Sandhya Nirmojana Sutras. And so Nalanda masters have actually made this kind of distinction between the definitive and the provisional teachings through reason. And therefore in Tibet, when we actually explain the philosophical views, I mean, we are able to do that thoroughly because of having studied the philosophy uh, through reason and lots of critical analysis uh, have gone into these teachings, these philosophical views. And so these are thanks to Kam uh, Master Shandarakshi, the, the great abbot, and his main disciple Kamala Shila. And so, so today, if you have to actually explain and um, uh, the uh, philosophical views of Buddhism, there's no better language than Tibetan. In Tibet, in, in China proper also, when Chinese are growing their interest, growing in interest to study Buddhism and Buddhist philosophy more and more, they even take interest in learning Tibetan language. And so, because of the hard work that was done by our ancestors, today we have this uh, tradition of Buddhism which can be explained through reason thoroughly and precisely. And so we have to feel proud of it and be able to keep this tradition. So I do respect all religious traditions, of course, whereas other religions are not able to sit together with scientists and have discussions thoroughly, whereas we, our monks, are able to do that, to have thorough discussions with scientists. So we can also learn, uh, there's mutual benefit. We learn a lot from the sci scientists, the uh, explanations and descriptions, and we can also contribute to the scientific knowledge from our tradition. So this is just a general introductory talk. So I have asked the organizers that uh, we could have the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life as a basis for, te for teaching this time. And when you have some time, you should actually read this book. And when you become unhappy, restless, and disturbed, you should read this sixth chapter, which is the chapter on patience. Uh, it'll help to um, calm you down. So the, the main cause of our disturbance of mind is because of our self-cherishing attitude, thinking I, 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 me, me, me. And so in order to, in order to uh, counter that self-cherishing attitude, you should read that eighth chapter, which is the chapter on meditation, but which teaches that of the bodhicitta in the, um, um, by means of equaling and exchanging self and others. And then I also have decided to give teaching on uh, the, jewel, the Precious Lamb by Master Kuno Lama Tenzin Gelsen, the Kinori Negi Master Tenzin Gelsen Rinpoche, from whom I received a teaching on the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. So he was a great master uh, who was following um, the ecumenical um, uh, tradition, non-sectarianism. And so in 1967, I received uh, when I saw Rinpoche's um, book, this uh, praise of Bodhicitta, the jewel, uh, precious jewel, so I felt really inspired, and then I decided to uh, receive teaching uh, on this uh, on his book, and then also uh, teaching on the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. And Rinpoche told me that if I could give teachings on, uh, more teachings on the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, it would be very beneficial to people. So I always keep my uh, copy of Bodhisattva Charya Avatara next to me. 
So it's really, it's really helpful and beneficial to me. So mainly we are going to go through this book, Bodhisattva Charya Avatara. And then also I will uh, go through the jewel uh, lamp. So if you wish to uh, get the book, um, uh, you may find it in the market, The Jewel Lamp, um, A Praise of Bodhicitta, translated by Gareth Sparham, Dr. Gareth Sparham. Um, so perhaps if I could cover 20 pages a day of the Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, I may be able to finish this book in these three days. English. So Kundalama Rinpoche and Zen Gelsen, the Kinori Negi Master, have, has, uh, had told me that this uh, Shandideva wrote this book, A Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, in the 8th century, and since then, there has never been a greater text for uh, practice of bodhicitta than this, and uh, there will never be, he said. So whatever you do, it's important to have uh, pure motivation, the correct motivation. So earlier, So in earlier you uh, recited this verse which says as long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, may I too abide to dispel the misery of the transmigrators. So the, the essence of practicing bodhicitta, the, the bodhicitta is to, and the, the, the practice of Buddhism is to remain in samsara as long as there are suffering beings to whom one could serve, whom one could serve. So if you look at the world today, we don't have to actually quote lines from Bodhisattva Charya Avatar or anything. I mean, the situation is so unfortunate that people are causing trouble and harm to others because of creating division between us and they, us and them. And this is because of the, uh, the fact that people are lost in the sensorial uh, uh, experiences of the sensorial stimuli and not really thinking through what causes happiness, what brings about happiness to us, what causes us suffering. So people are ignorant be and because of being disturbed by Or negative emotions, the afflictive emotions like those of desirous uh, clinging and hatred. And so to counter the negative emotions such as uh, attachment, hatred and so forth, we need, I mean, uh, which are rooted in a self-cherishing attitude, we need to counter it with that of the um, uh, holding others more dearer to one than oneself, and to counter this grasping at some kind of independent existence and things, you should counter it. I mean, you should develop the wisdom, realizing this uh, emptiness. And so, these um, uh, practices really help transform us. 
So you can see uh, that these negative emotions and the wrong, distorted views are the ones which cause us lots of problems. So we are all human beings, same in terms of physical, mental and, spirit, and emotional. Uh, so once I was in Sweto in South Africa, in, uh, so it's already 10 o'clock, do we have some tea? So we'll have a short break here. If you need to go to the loo, please do so. And then come in, come back and take your tea. So we'll have 10 minutes break. No. Hmm? No. This one. You can hear. So those who have questions, please come forward and ask your questions. Okay. It's <laughs> oh. Huh? This lady was briefed by Quasi. It's quite something. So her question is. So the Bodhisattva Charya Avatara teaches very extensively the practices of both the skillful means and wisdom. So how do we, how do we, since it's really broad, um, how do we put it into practice? So in order to practice, so with regard to the followers, this you did you call it? We speak of two different kinds of practitioners, those who rely heavily on reasoning and those who merely rely on faith, as has been uh, explained in uh, uh, explicit explanation of the meaning by Haribhadra. Likewise, we have to follow the same. So if you follow reasoning, then what happens is you generate conviction and finally you will reach a stage when everything that you uh, come across will be conducive to your practice because your approach is something which is uh, based on reasoning and not mere faith. Uh, however, when it's only related to the practice of uh, 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 doing a religious practice merely based on faith, this is something not uh, unique to uh, Buddhism. This is something every other religious tradition does. And so there isn't, uh, uh, so there isn't any unique quality in it if it's practiced by Buddhists. So what we have to do is follow the practice as is, uh, as is the tradition of those who are intellectually inclined. So in the ninth chapter, Shantideva says, uh, all these different uh, paths, uh, the Buddha has taught them for the benefit of uh, wisdom. Therefore, make all efforts to generate wisdom. Again, uh, Nagarjuna says, uh, the Buddha has taught two different kinds of truths, the conventional and ultimate. So likewise, in the supplication that I've written, by understanding the basic nature of things, uh, the two truths, as the foundation, uh, so when we speak of the ultimate uh, 
nature, we are speaking of uh, them being dependent and originated. And because of being dependent and originated, they are uh, devoid of any intrinsic nature. So based on this understanding, if you could establish the notion of the four noble truths, then it will be re really fruitful. So this is something that you should could take. By understanding the two uh, natures of the two truths, you will know, you come to understand how to, uh, how to abandon the two uh, former two truths and embrace the, the second two truths. So it's important that you should uh, follow the tradition of those uh, who are intellectually inclined based on reasoning. So uh, we have, I have been uh, emphasizing the need on reliance heavy reliance on uh, reasoning. And if the, we could do this, then the Buddha Tama could survive for very long. Otherwise, if you merely follow faith, then you have lots of doubts. So if we follow this tradition of uh, relying on heavy reasoning, then Buddha Tama would uh, survive for several hundreds of years again. Otherwise, I'm not sure if our practice of relying on uh, uh, practice of uh, conducting our religious uh, uh, practice, if it's merely based on fear, then I'm not very sure how long Buddhism will survive on, uh, in this modern world. So then others will also come to see that we are only observing uh, what we have been traditionally, what has been traditionally practiced. So it isn't anything particularly unique about merely following faith. And then we speak of the truth of cessation. And the fact that uh, the truth of cessation could be established is ultimately entirely dependent on uh, the understanding of uh, uh, emptiness. Because so how strong negative emotions like attachment and anger might be, all of them are based on ignorance, which is a distortion of reality. So it's very important to have a sound understanding of emptiness by which then you could generate uh, a sound understanding of what truth of cessation of the delusions would entail or what would mean. So once if you your approach is uh, reason-based, then the conviction within uh, you is something very concrete. So if you, yeah, just the youngsters, it's very important for you to understand, uh, uh, know uh, the nature of the Four Noble Truths. And for that, you need a sound understanding of the Two Noble Truths, uh, sorry, Two Truths. Second question. Uh, Your Holiness, you speak of uh, uh, ethics uh, which is based on uh, religious uh, teachings and another which is not based on religious teachings. So how can you practice something which is uh, 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 ethics uh, not based on religious uh, traditions. So, his only answers. There are more than seven billion human beings. Uh, about one billion, or more than one billion, uh, doesn't believe in a religious tradition, and they don't. Uh, you can't blame them because there are lots of exploitations happening uh, uh, in the name of happening around the world in the name of religion. So due to all different difficult experiences that people have experienced over uh, centuries, there's a reason why many are fed up of uh, religious tradition. But then it is also true that these people definitely need, uh, uh, they also want happiness and do not want, do not desire uh, sufferings. So now we need reasoning. Mm -hmm. 
So somebody earlier told me that now it's uh, money that really rules the world. And in a way, it's almost true in some way. As if uh, the whole thing that we mm, do, the whole kind of uh, modern practice seems to be oriented towards material facilities. However, the fact still remains that even if you have enough material facilities, if you do not know how to manage your mind or emotions properly, you will not lead a very uh, happy life. For example, I have friends like a chancellor who has kind of uh, come out over several thousands of uh, students. But that chancellor, although materially speaking, he is well off, uh, always uh, uh, remains in some kind of uh, disturbed state of mind. So this shows that there is something lacking despite having all the material facilities. So if we were to uh, uh, introduce uh, ethics based on religion, then certain people would not be attracted to this concept. So it's important to have an approach which is not associated with uh, religious tradition, but still they need the practice of compassion and discipline and so forth. So the secular that I uh, have uh, pioneered uh, at the secular ethics that I have pioneered is something very important. But this does not mean disrespect uh, to release tradition as it's understood in some part of the world. My understanding of secular ethics is dependent on the Indian uh, understanding, which uh, uh, apart from maintaining uh, respect for all religious traditions, goes far beyond the religious boundary and embraces, uh, and embraces practice which is somehow in a kind of uh, impartial. So this is my approach of secular ethics. His question relates to the terminologies uh, of new Tibetan uh, terms which were not there in the past. So, for example, uh, terms with uh, respect to economy, modern economy, modern science. So there are translations in Tibet and also some other translations uh, here in exile. So what would be a good consensus for us to converge on these terms? And his holiness says it is for the uh, scholars to decide. We have more, more than six million Tibetans. And if you look at our language, although we have different uh, like uh, accents or dialect, local dialects or so forth, but basically, fundamentally, we have the same script. So even if uh, we have the same language, if these are read, people have different accents in reading them, but uh, we still have the same script, the language, we, and the langu Tibetan language, which encompasses uh, as a foundation, which, which is the foundation on which uh, uh, the sutras and uh, shastras are all based. This is not just uh, unique to Tibetan, but this is something which is widespread in the Himalayan regions as well, even in Bhutan. So it's for the scholars to come to uh, some kind of consensus. Some, I have heard new terminologies have been introduced in Tibet. Those are very good. Uh, that's very good, but it's important that uh, we, uh, the, the translators could come together and meet and discuss. So personally, I can't really recommend something concrete at this point. My question is, Uh, my uh, experience of uh, compassion and love 
uh, come from my uh, is associated with my parents and my uh, mother recently died this has been almost like 28 years so your holiness would you please pray for my mother of course definitely so I have this kind of overwhelming grief is something not only I have undergone, but, but this is something universal. So in the face of such tragic loss, what would be a beneficial kind of a attitude or a practice that we, that we can uh, assume in such a uh, such kind of a tragic experience? So, uh, as far as suffering is concerned, there are different levels. Uh, suf suffering of misery or suffering suffering, suffering change, and pervasive composite suffering. And there are other sufferings where uh, sufferings of failures, not being able to get uh, promotion and so forth. So, these are something that we can practically solve through our own efforts. But then also people who have all the material fa facilities with lots of money but still do not have uh, sufficient mental peace. So although they have these material facilities, despite that, they, the fact that they lack peace of mind is because what they are engaging is only the uh, suffering of change. And what they are in indulging in is only with uh, uh, suffering of change. So, and the third one, so long as you are, are under compulsion of negative emotions and karma, uh, you can't really eliminate this entirely. So this elimination comes uh, with the attainment of truth of cessations. So this is something uh, which is going to take a lot of time. But somehow through our mind training, uh, uh, we can some reduce the impact of uh, the sufferings upon us through proper maintaining when it uh, relates to the uh, suffering of uh, change and suffering of suffering. And then we have to look at the nature of samsara, how prosperous a samsaric uh, experience might be. If you have an understanding how the nature of samsara is, and then it's not something uh, so shocking, so long as you have an understanding that you, while you are in samsara, this is bound to happen at some point. So, of course, it's uh, although what we have for our loved one is, uh, in, in, from worldly sense, love, it's something associated with attachment. So, now, now what we really need to train is train on some kind of love which is not associated with attachment. So it is expounded in the sixth chapter of uh, uh, Bodhisattva Ch Chariot. Uh, in that text, it says, your enemy is, your, is the one who really uh, gives you an opportunity to practice patience. Therefore, there is enough reason for, to practice love towards your enemy. So if you somehow are able to extend your love and compassion for those who even instead of uh, being friendly, harm you, then this kind of practice of compassion is something which is not associated with attachment. And this is what we have to struggle. So this will be covered uh, in the teaching later. Thank you, Your Holiness. So tea needs to be served inside. Uh, He's asking. Some haven't received tea. With, the with this application, may bodhicitta be generated in those who have not generated, and may it expand in those who have already generated it, and may they never degenerate. So now, what's your question? He's always asking. My question is. In the Tibetan medical tradition, we have uh, four tantras. So, is that uh, something which comes under Buddhist, Buddhism? 
because uh, there are some kind of practices there taught in that text which I feel may not be consistent with Buddhism. So is that, uh, are those four tantras of uh, Tibetan medical tradition, uh, sources of Tibetan medical tradition, knowledge, so uh, uh, do they fall within Buddhism, His Holiness? Uh, for, for me to answer this properly, first I have to study it. And I'm, I'm sorry to say I personally have not much of knowledge about Tibetan medicine. So whatever the case is, although it's a medical tradition, tradition sorry, most of the scholars who wrote those extensive texts on uh, Tibetan medicine are Buddhist scholars. And again, and there are uh, like texts by Nagarjuna, which specifically, um, specifically uh, uh, talks about uh, uh, kind of a different uh, ways of treat, treating patients and so forth. And even if, uh, if somehow the text teaches about a kind of a basic uh, discipline in ordinary mundane way of life. This is something which not be may not be inconsistent with uh, uh, Tharma because this really even if there are not like uh, higher practice of Tharma, they still are related to uh, uh, bringing about happiness in our daily lives. So when you have to his question, question. There are diff three diff kinds of dependent origination. Dependent origination based on causes and uh, conditions. Dependent origination based on, on parts. And dependent origination based on mental designation. Well, scientists have, uh, as far as from a quantum physics point of view is concerned, scientists found that things do not exist objectively. However, in Abhidhamma Kaushakarika, we speak of different kinds of, uh, different levels of particles. So, somehow it's, there's a confusion in me, because if I were to speak of the uh, uh, tiniest particles, or s such as a particle of water, heat, and so forth. This is quite confusing because, on one side, I have this scientific knowledge. On one side, Abhidha Makoshikari speaks of uh, subtle um, particles uh, which seem to exist. So, Your Holiness, uh, I'm sure you have covered both of these uh, things. So, uh, have you ever come across uh, discussions? Uh, 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 that uh, touches these topics. Yeah, where there is a contention between both scholars, Buddhist scholars and uh, scientists. So his audience answers. The way of approach uh, in finding something may be different. For example, if I were to uh, search for something, uh, if I were to search myself, uh, uh, my garment, and then I can come uh, to pick up this uh, handkerchief. So when we speak of uh, uh, critically searching things, for example, as has been emphasized in Prasankega, so if things are critically, as in Matyamika, uh, avatara it's, uh, or engaging in the middle. Uh, Chandrika says, if we were to see, uh, search for external objects uh, and, f uh, and after coming to this end, then they do not exist objectively, then the means by which they could only exist would be through mental imputation, from subjective imputation. However, uh, usually uh, in when we, uh, on, a, on a conventional level, when we search for something, most of us get, get, her, get carried, carried away by this notion or by this understanding that things could most probably would have some kind of uh, objective existence. So without uh, uh, 
analysis or on the ultimate nature, what we are searching here is we are trying to search for a kind of a conventional subtle object. So the more of a searching uh, uh, for the final kind of uh, object are different. One is from a conventional position without uh, without addressing the ultimate nature, we do our investigation and fighting, which is the subtlest part or not. But on another side, the Matiamika approach is trying to find out the ultimate nature within the object of label. Then again, the subjective mind, we can speak of different levels of subject mind, a grosser level of mind when we're at the, uh, at the awakened stage, when we're in deep sleep, and all the di different uh, levels of mind during the dissolution processes uh, when we die, or uh, at death. For example, if, when we die, all the brain becomes death. And then we have also examples of people staying in clear light meditation uh, at death. So this is a clear indication of uh, the presence of the subtlest mind. So recently we have had some uh, practitioners who died and still uh, physically remained fresh despite being clinically dead. So we have some kind of a, a project to investigate such uh, practitioners. So several years have passed and scientists take a keen interest in uh, in this in, uh, project. So what this indicates is that there are different levels of subtleties of mind. But if you critically analyze on the ultimate nature, then even uh, the subjective mind is something which is mere, which is something unfindable. So therefore, Matyamika Avatara says, as there is no alternative uh, since object or label or, or, or since conventional entities do not exist from their own side, even if the subjective mind doesn't exist from their own side, then it's based on worldly convention on which, based on worldly conven uh, convention which establishes, uh, establishes their existence. So they exist by more of, uh, you know, uh, existence from the side of the object, if it's negated, it somehow inadvertently uh, implies that the, uh, the existence uh, from conventional designation uh, is established. So Madhyamika says, although objectively things do not exist from their own side, that doesn't mean external objects do not exist, because we can still posit or postulate the existence of uh, external objects by means of conventional uh, designation or conventional uh, establishment. As far as cosmology is concerned, although we do not have uh, particular terms addressing Big Bang and so forth, but we also speak of like space particle, the subtlest particle. And this space particle has neither beginning nor uh, end with respect to its continuation. So this subtlest particle has neither beginning, uh, space particle, nor end. So that's what we call it. Uh, that's uh, that is what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is the space particle, the, the subtlest particle. And if it gets grosser, then we can speak of uh, atoms. And then from then onwards, after atom uh, and so forth, when it gets grosser, then we have energy and then heat is produced. And then after heat, liquid is formed and then we have sorted. So dissolution, when dissolution occurs, uh, it's uh, through this, the reversal order until you taste the subtlest particle of space. So this is something related to the external object, but when we refer to uh, ourselves within, uh, we, uh, our, as our body is something dependent on the four elements, we can speak of the elements as well as uh, the der uh, derivatives of elements such as uh, 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 smell, 
Tees und so fort. So, when the dissolution occurs, uh, the earth dissolves into water, and finally, uh, the, and this through this sequence of dissolution, finally, uh, the consciousness dissolves into uh, space. So, in this respect of uh, uh, space, uh, in, in this context, space uh, refers to different. Uh, different levels of emptiness. Oh. For example, we are speaking of the uh, emptiness expe as experienced during red radiance. Uh, and finally, uh, the clear light experience, the emptiness uh, uh, being experienced by the clear light, subjective clear light mind. So, Everything that exists arises from the subtlest clear light, and finally they dissolve back into the subtlest clear light. Well, so when we speak of uh, uh, the highest yoga practice, we are actually uh, applying uh, this subtlest clear light a mind in our practice and the understanding of higher yoga tatra is something which is based on the understanding of this dissolution and arising process so we speak of four levels of emptiness and once we reach the fourth level <coughs> The subtle subjective mind is the clear light mind, and this is combined with the ultimate uh, objective clear light or emptiness, as has been taught uh, in the uh, uh, second turning wheel or Prajapadriva uh, Sutras. So, uh, subtle clear light has been expounded uh, in Sutra Alamkara. Uh, and also tantric texts are uh, text. So we combined uh, the second turning of will, the teachings of uh, second turning of will, as well as the subjective mind as uh, expounded in third turning will, will uh, third turning will, uh, will. And this combination is something which is, uh, uh, which forms the basis of the uh, practice of uh, the combination of or the union of the, uh, uh, sorry, I, got, I didn't get that, sorry. So this forms the basis of practice of Mahamudra and so and so forth. So when we speak of a subtlest uh, entity, when it comes, uh, when we are referring to external objects, we are speaking of the subtlest space particle, but when it comes to internal thing, we are speaking of uh, speaking in terms of the subtlest clear light. So for more than 30 years we have been having interactions, I have been having interactions with scientists. Uh, in the field of cosmology, although we have some basic uh, explanation, uh, we, we have we learn, got a great deal from the scientists. And then when it comes to neurobiology, Although we have from our medical uh, texts uh, some explanation of biology and also from uh, Highest Yoga Tantra uh, where there is an explanation of the different channels or chakras and as also the energies and so forth. So this is something we, uh, from outside we can present to them. And then the quantum physics uh, as explained in Buddhism is very rich and very uh, extensive. And then psychology. When it comes to psychology, basically they only rely on the sensorial minds, the senses, and they do not address the mental consciousness. 
and also other religious traditions do not speak of the mental consciousness. It's only uh, the, uh, with respect to the five senses uh, that their approaches are more kind of uh, focused. However, India has a tradition of where there is a combination, the practice of combining calm abiding and the superior insight or shamatha or wisdom. So this only relates to the mental consciousness, the sixth mind. So from uh, uh, the Sutra point of view, the, the union of uh, Vipassana and Shamatha and, uh, the, un uh, and the union of subtle skylight uh, uh, with uh, the emptiness as taught in Tantraena, these are something which are related uh, uh, to the Buddhist psychology and, and particularly the Indian tradition. And uh, as comparatively, the Western psychology is, is very limited and uh, the understanding of psychology is also very kind of a, uh, at a kind of a beginning stage. Then also, now uh, scientists uh, have seen that uh, through the training of mind, especially training on calm abiding and so forth, there is a possibility of the mind impacting the brains. So apart from brain, now they are somehow, uh, uh, they seem to be accepting a different entity called mind, uh, something distinct from the brain. Recently, uh, I received an invi invitation to participate in the Kumbh Mela, a Hindu festival of... So earlier, I, and, uh, I came across some uh, uh, Hindu practitioners, uh, San Numbrid practitioners, who uh, spent their uh, time in solitude, nakedly meditating in the Himalayan uh, mountains. So I was thinking of uh, having some kind of conversation with them. We also have the pra uh, some British practitioners uh, who would uh, practice uh, uh, the Tumu heat and they would drench first uh, uh, a kind of a shawl in water and then put it uh, on their body and change it almost like four or five times so or ten times uh, and all the uh, all the clothes would be completely dried through the practice of tumu however if your practice is not something which uh, encompasses all of the different aspects of uh, the path, then it, this is something uh, partial, which is common to the uh, non-Buddhist practice. And so this isn't, this isn't something unique and uh, not sufficient. So although I uh, uh, couldn't uh, be naked like them and meditate like them, I thought uh, a discussion would be uh, fruitful. However, this did not materialize. So today's world is full of uh, killing, anger, and so forth. So uh, it's a very unfortunate uh, situation that we are in. So how do we uh, practice compassion that is taught in Buddhism, which could uh, to counter this situation? So with regard to compassion, some uh, in the Bodhisattva Charya Avatar also it is said that uh, if you paint it here on compassion, cultivate compassion, you become unhappy, more and more unhappy. So what you need to understand is the disturbance that uh, ha that happens in our mind is because of our uh, di uh, disturbing emotions such as ch self-cherishing attitude and also that of grasping at some true independent existence in things. 
also because of our clinging attachment and also uh, hatred, it disturbs our peace of mind. And therefore, the more compassionate and altruist, uh, altruistic you are, it'll help you to counter this disturbance of mind. And so, in order to counter it, you cannot just make prayers to God or whatever, and whereas you, you should cultivate uh, compassion, love, and affection towards others to counter this. So this one is uh, wondering I mean, uh, if the students in the front row have had their tea. He didn't see them drinking tea. So I will read from the beginning of the text. As I said earlier, have a correct motivation on the part of the disciples, the audience, and also I, on, on the part of myself, the teacher, I will also have the correct motivation. So what that means is that you should think uh, along these lines, as long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, may I too abide to dispel the miseries of the transmigrators. So with this uh, altruistic attitude, you should listen to the teaching. In the Indian language, it is called the, uh, called the Bodhisattva Charya Avatara. In the Tibetan, Chanjusin Jebala Jukpa and uh, in, translated as the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life in English. And then the first verse, respectfully I bow to the Sugatas, who are the sovereign um, well, um, over the Dhammakaya, as well as the noble uh, sons, and to all who are worthy of veneration. And here I shall explain how to engage in the vows of the Buddha's children the meaning of which I have condensed in accordance with the scriptures. And um, with regards to Buddhism, uh, the Buddhi uh, Buddhists are those who take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And so, uh, Chandra Kitti says, uh, those who aspire um, to liberation take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So you should understand what the Dharma is in order to understand the uh, teaching uh, what the Buddha and the Sangha refer to. And there is nothing here that has not been explained before, and I have no skill in the art of rhetoric, therefore lacking any intention to benefit others. I write this in order to acquaint to it to my mind. So what uh, uh, by the uh, third line in the second verse, Master Chandi Deva is saying is that I don't uh, uh, expect to benefit many sentient beings with this uh, uh, book, but I write it in order to acquaint my mind to it. For due to acquaintance with what is wholesome, the force of my faith may for a short while increase because of these words. If, however, these words are seen by others equal in fortune to myself, it may be meaningful for them. Our leisure in term are very hard to find, and since accomplished, since they accomplish what is meaningful for humanity, if you, if uh, I do not take advantage of them now, uh, how will a perfect opportunity come about again? And just as a flash of lightning on a dark cloudy night, for instance, brightly, illumi brightly illuminate all, all, likewise, in this world through the might of Buddha, a wholesome thought rarely and briefly appears. And so the Buddhas were sentient beings, ordinary sentient beings like us, for example, um, in the beginning. And through engaging in the path, cultivating the path themselves, uh, they became enlightened. And those who are on the path also have treaded, uh, have reached their attainments through the practice of the path. 
And so with regard to bodhicitta, um, it is complemented by the wish to help others, serve others, and uh, with compassion. And so, uh, one of the commentaries on Abhisamaya Alamkara, uh, which was uh, written by either Vimukti Sena or somebody, um, in his commentary, uh, it says, the, with compassion, the bodhisattvas, or the, uh, the practitioners, uh, um, look at the um, focus their mind on sentient beings, and with the that of the uh, wisdom, they focus their mind on uh, the uh, omniscience, the Buddhahood, and so the the. Um, with regard to the term Changchup for enlightenment, Bodhi in uh, uh, in Sanskrit. Uh, Chang has the meaning of purifying uh, n negativities and chupa in the sense of um, uh, being fully knowledgeable of everything. And so wisdom, with wisdom the Bodhisattvas uh, focus their mind on enlightenment. So with the help of this uh, wisdom, your compassion will uh, increase infinitely. And so, for the sake of all other sentient beings, you focus or you intend to become a Buddha for the benefit of them. All the Buddhas who have contemplated, verse number seven, all the Buddhas who have contemplated for eons have seen it to be beneficial. So, referring to bodhicitta. For it is limitless mass, yeah, by, by it the limitless masses of mad beings will quickly attain the supreme state of bliss. Those who wish to be destroyed many sorrows of their conditioned existence, those who wish all beings to experience a multitude of joys, and those who uh, wish to experience much happiness should never forsake the awakening mind, this bodhicitta. So you restrain harming others by holding them dear to yourself. Not that if you cause harm to them, I mean, it'll harm me. So that is more narrow-minded thinking. And so this is how the, uh, the, uh, the basic vehicle tra trainees actually uh, uh, restrain themselves uh, from harming others. And so, where, um, whereas when you actually think along the line that it is because uh, they are dear to me that I should not harm others, it's much more powerful and deep, profound. So your higher rebirth is also related to holding others dear to yourself, and also that of the omniscient state of Buddhahood also is uh, uh, thanks to bodhicitta. And so, on a daily basis, you'll be healthy physically and also you have peace of mind. And so, the altruism really helps you to think of others and have um, uh, draw these benefit for yourself as well. Whereas the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, they focus on their own um, fulfillment of their own goals and not really thinking of others, to benefiting others as such. Whereas if you are altruistic, if you have altruism, this altruistic attitude, you only think of, of benefiting others. So, in the, uh, at the end of the third chapter of this book, it says, Today, in the presence of all the protectors, I invite the world of, uh, uh, to be my guest at the festival of the Sugata Hood and the temporary happiness, uh, a delightful happiness. May gods and demigods uh, and all and, uh, be joyful. So, should, uh, verse number eight, and then verse number nine, the moment an awakening mind arises in those fettered and weak in the jail of cyclic existence, they will be named a child of Sugathas and will be revered for 
by both humans and gods of the world, it is like the supreme gold, elect, gold making elixir, for it transforms the unclean body we have taken into the priceless jewel of Buddha form. Therefore, I firmly seize this awakening mind. And then the next verse also, since the limitless mind and so forth. So even when you recite a uh, uh, single uh, six-syllable mantra and also give a, a morsel of food to animals like dogs and so forth, and also if you create uh, certain good karmas for long longevity and so forth, I mean, uh, the, those um, uh, positive, wholesome actions that you actually engage in will have their, um, as, I mean, uh, the, no sooner their fruits are enjoyed, and the, that's the end of those uh, wholesome actions. And if you create wholesome actions for higher rebirth, I mean, once you uh, gain that re uh, higher rebirth in the next life, I mean, that's the end of the, uh, the, uh, the result of that uh, action. Whereas if you actually dedicate your um, wholesome actions for the benefit of all sentient beings across the expanse of space, these infinite sentient beings. So, um, until the, uh, the end of space, that uh, uh, wholesome action will not um, um, uh, run out of its fruits. So, all the, uh, other virtues like, like plantain trees, for after bearing fruit, they simply perish. Yet the perennial tree of awakening mind unceasing bear, unceasingly bears a fruit and therefore flourishing without end. And then like uh, and, uh, verse number 13, and then the next verse number 14, and verse number 15 was the one that was used earlier in the presentation of the debate. Uh, the, uh, the first debate that was uh, presented. In brief, the awakening mind should be understood of, uh, to be of two types, the mind that aspires to awaken and the mind that ventures to do so. So from the time when one takes bodhisattva vows, uh, pledging to engage in the bodhisattva practices, uh, that uh, from then on it says, um, the, uh, there is going to be infinite uh, call, uh, benefit of fruits. Although, uh, verse number 17 says, although great fruits occur in cyclic existence from the mind that aspires to awakening, awakening um, an uninterrupted, uninterrupted flow of merit does not, uh, does not ensue, as it does with venturing mind. And for those who have perfectly seized this mind with the thought never to turn away from totally um, liberating the infinite forms of life, the, for their time hence, even while asleep and unconcerned, a force of merit. Um, equal to the sky will um, perpetually en en ensue. So all uh, sentient beings work for uh, overcoming their suffering and uh, uh, gaining happiness, isn't it? While they, I mean, despite their efforts, they still cause themselves suffering. Why? Because they actually are passionate about in, uh, indulging in the causes of suffering. So, if you want happiness, you need to uh, uh, you sh need to help others, benefit others. Whereas, if you want to overcome suffering, you need to uh, avoid harming others. So although wishing to be rid of misery, the, the, the verse number 28 says, they run towards misery itself. Although wishing to have happiness like an enemy, they ignorantly destroy it. Verse number 29, for those who are deprived of happiness and burdened with many sorrows, it satisfies them with all joys, dispels all suffering, and clears away confusion. Where is there a comparable virtue? Where is there even a, such a friend? Where is there merit similar to this? 
if whoever repays a kind deed it's, uh, is worthy of some praise, then what need to mention the bodhisattvas who g do good without it being asked for it of them. And the final verse of this chapter, I bow to the body of those in whom the sacred precious mind of bodhicitta who thinks of benefiting others and I seek refuge in the, that source of joy who brings to happiness even those who bring harm. So even those who are actually harming you because of your bodhicitta and they become related to you in a positive way through your attitudes. So that's the first chapter, which is the chapter on um, the benefit of the awakening mind. And then the next chapter, in order to seize that precious mind, I offer now to the Thakadas, to the sacred dharma, the stainless jewel, and to the disciples of Buddha, the oceans of excellence, whatever flowers and fruits there are, and whatever kind of medicine, kinds of medicine, whether jewels exist in this world, and whatever clean, refreshing waters, likewise, gem and crusted mountains, forest groves, quiet and joyful places, heavenly trees be decked with flowers and trees with fruit-laden uh, branches. Fragrances of celestial rams, incense, wishing tree, and jewel trees, uncultivated harvests, and all ornaments that are worthy of being offered, lakes and pools adorned with lotus and beautiful cry of wild geese, everything unowned within the limitless spheres of space. Creating these things in my mind, I offer them to the supreme beings, the Buddhas, as well as their children. O oh, compassionate one, think kindly of me and accept these offerings of, accept these offerings of mine. Having no merit, I am destitute. And so in making offering to the Buddhas and so forth, you uh, make offering of your body in this dear service. So when you say offering your body, it means you are offering it for uh, in dear service. And I have no other gifts to offer. O protector, you, think who th you who think of helping others by your power, accept these for my sake. So you should actually think of uh, whatever you do with your body, speech, and mind, they are for the benefit of all sentient beings. Eternally shall I offer all my bodies to the conquerors and dear children. Please accept me, you supreme heroes. Respectfully, I sh shall I be your subject? So, you should think that you are someone who are at the disposal of sentient beings for their um, use. Uh, the, the sentient beings who are as infinite as the expanse of space. So this is a very um, powerful thought. I beseech the Tathagatas and the children to come and bath their bodies from many jeweled uh, vases filled with water scented and enticing uh, to the accompaniment of music and song. Let me dry their bodies and so forth. Verse number 16, verse number 17. I offer them jeweled lamps arranged on golden lotus buds upon land sprinkled with scented water. I scatter delicate flower petals. The, to those who have the nature of compassion, I offer palaces resounding with melodious hymns, exquisitely illuminated by hanging pearls and gems that adorn the infinites of, infinities of space. Eternally shall I offer to all the Buddha's jeweled umbrellas with golden handles and exquisite uh, ornaments embellished with the uh, to the rims, standing erect, the shapes beautiful to behold, and in addition, may a mass of offerings resounding with sweet and pleasing uh, music, like clouds that appease the misery of all, each remaining for as long as necessary, and may a continuous rain of flowers and precious gems descend upon the liquorice and statues, and upon all the jewels of dharma, 
in the same way as Manjugosha and others have made offerings to the conquerors, similarly to do either bestow gifts upon the Tathagatas that protect us, their children, and to all uh, glorify the oceans of excellence with the limitless verses of harmonious um, praise. May these clouds of gentle eulogy constantly ascend to their presence with bodies as numerous as the old atoms within the universe. I prostrate to all the Buddhas of the three times and the Dharma and Supreme Community. Likewise, I prostrate to all the reliquaries, um, reliquaries to the basis of the awakening minds, to all learned abbots and masters, and to all. And so in the part which deals with confession, it teaches that of impermanence. So throughout beginning a cyclic existence in this life and others, unknowingly I've committed transgression and I ordered them to be done by others. Overwhelmed by the deception of ignorance, I rejoiced in what was done by now, but now seeing these mistakes from my heart, I confess them to the Buddhas. Whatever harmful actions, acts of body, speech, and mind I have done in a disturbed sense, uh, mental state towards the three jewels of refuge, uh, my parents, my spiritual masters, and others, and all the grave wrongs done by me, so thoroughly in vile and polluted, with an abundance of faults, I openly declare to the guides of the world. Um, but I, I may well perish before all my transgressions have been purified. So please protect me in such a way as will swiftly and surely free me from them. The untrustworthy lot of death waits not for things to be done or undone. Whether I see I'm sick or healthy, this fleeting lifespan is unstable. Leaving all, I must depart alone. Yet through not having understood this, I committed various kinds of wrongdoing for the sake of my friends and foes. My foes will become nothing. My friends will become nothing. I too will become nothing. I likewise all will become nothing. Just like the dream experience, whatever things I enjoy will become a memory. Whatever has passed will not be seen again. Even within this life, brief life, many friends and foes have passed, but whatever unbearable wrongdoing I committed for them remains ahead of me. Thereby, through not having realized that I shall suddenly vanish, I committed so much wrong out of ignorance, lust and hate. Remaining neither day nor night, life is always slipping by and never getting any longer. Why would, why would death not come to one like me while I'm lying in bed, although surrounded by my friends and relatives? The feeling of life being severed will be experienced by me alone. When seized by the messengers of death, what benefit will friends and relatives afford? My merit alone shall protect me then. But upon that, I have never relied. O oh, protector, I, so unconcerned, unaware of such terror as this accumulated a great deal of negative actions for the sake of this transient life. Petrified is the person today wing, being led to the to torture chamber with a dry mouth and dreadful sunken eyes. His entire appearance is transfigured. Whatever need to mention, and so forth. So that's the end of the second chapter. He's almost finished. And uh, chapter three, gladly do I rejoice in the virtues that relative relieves the misery of all those in unfortunate states and that gives happiness to the suffering. I rejoice in that gathering of virtue that is the cause for our heart's awakening. I rejoice in the definite freedom of embodied creatures from the miseries of cyclic existence. I rejoice in the awakening of Buddhas and also in the spiritual levels of their children. So with regard to the dedication, it's very nice. May I be doctor, the medicine, and may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world. Verse number 8 in chapter 3. Um, Until everyone is healed, may a rain of food and drink descend to clear away the pains of thirst and uh, hunger. And during the eon of famine, may I myself change into food and drink. May I become... An, exhaustible, an inexhaustible treasure for those who are poor and destitute. May I turn into all things they could need and be placed close 
beside them with any sense of without any sense of loss i shall give up my body and enjoyments as well as my virtues of the three times for the sake of benefiting others by giving up all sorrow is transcended and my mind be, will re realize the sorrowless state it is the best it is best that i now give everything to all sentient beings i am uh, uh, in the same way as I shall at death. So if in those, uh, verse number 16, who encounter me are faithful or angry, Um, a thought arises may that eternally become the source for fulfilling all their wishes So, with regard to the actual generation of Buddha, uh, Bodhicitta, So, in, today, in the presence of our protectors, I invite all the world's guests and so forth. Um, uh, verse number 23, just as the previous Sugatas gave birth to a awakening mind, and just as they successively dwelt uh, in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise, for the sake of all that lives, do I give birth to the awakening mind, and likewise, I shall too successively follow the practices. So these two verses, 23 and 24, show the, uh, that of generation of Bodhicitta, and... Uh, in order to further increase, increase it from now on, those with discernment who have licitly seized an awakening mind this way should highly praise it in the following manner. Today my life has borne fruit and so forth. So when you dedicate yourself for the benefit of all sentient beings, you find satisfaction that you have been worthy of having uh, lived a life like this. And then there's praise of Bodhicitta, thus whatever, and so it says today my life is burned fruit and so forth, it was number 26 and 27, and then just like a blind man, a blind man, um, a blind person discovering a jewel in a heap of rubbish, likewise by some coincidence an awakened mind has been born within me, it is the supreme ambrosia that overcomes the, sovereign of, the sovereignty of death, it is an inexhaustible treasure that eliminates all poverty in the world. So because you are dedicated to work for the benefit of all sentient beings, as it was quoted earlier uh, in, at the end of verse number, I mean, chapter number 3, um, so because of your cherishing others over yourself, you would actually dedicate your body, speech, and mind for the benefit of others. And even if there may be some um, spirits and so forth that are supposed to be, um, you know, uh, snatching away your lifespan and uh, or harming your body and so forth, I mean, you could actually say, if you, um, whatever you like, take it. And... Uh, um, take uh, flesh if you want flesh, take um, um, whatever you want. Um, and when I was giving some teaching in Ladakh, I actually felt that um, instead of really trying to, uh, uh, you know, sh um, drive them away, these evil spirits or so-called evil spirits, I mean, you could. Act I thought that you could actually 
uh, tell them I mean, uh, take the, the lifespan, uh, my lifespan, I mean, uh, however you like, and so forth. So, chapter 3 finished. Chapter 4, having firmly seized the awakening mind in this way, conquerors, children must never waver. Always should they exert themselves to never stray from their practice. In the case of reckless actions or of deeds not well considered, although a promise may have been made, it is fit to reconsider what I should do them or whether I should do them or not. But how can I ever withdraw from what has been examined by the great wisdom of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and even uh, many times by me, myself, if having made such a promise, I do not put it into action, then by deceiving every living being, what kind of rebirth shall I take? If it has been taught by the Buddha that those who do not give way, the smallest thing which they once intended to give will take a rebirth as a hungry ghost, then if I should receive all sentient beings after having sincerely invited them to the unsurpassable bliss, shall I take a, um, a happy rebirth? So if we had been able to really uh, leave uh, a, a positive connection with the Buddha, I mean, uh, we would be better off than what we, the way we are now. And we have not done, been able to achieve that. And if uh, even during the times of masters like uh, Nagarjuna and Shantideva and so forth, we had created those kind of positive connections with them and have been able to practice the Dharma well, we would be much better off than what the way we are now. Then if um, only the omniscient, omniscient can discern the manner of the action of those who give up the awakening mind but be freed, it is beyond the scope of ordinary thought. This for a Bodhisattva is the heaviest of downfalls, for should it ever happen, the welfare of all will be weakened. And should others for even a single moment hinder or obstruct their wholesome deeds by weakening the welfare of all, there will be no end to the rebirth in lower states. For if my being is impa impaired by destroying the joy of even uh, one creature, then what need is there to mention destroying the joy of creatures vast as space? Thus, those who have the force of awakening mind as well as the force of falling from it stay revolving within cyclic existence and uh, for the long time are hindered from reaching the bodhisattva levels. Therefore, just as I have promised, I shall respectfully court my actions. If from now on I make on no effort, I shall descend to the lower states. And so, uh, the So with uh, these destructive emotions like attachment uh, and hatred and so forth, you make yourself unhappy and others also unhappy. So um, the text goes through the faults or the disadvantages of these destructive emotions. So although the, the negative emotions do not have limbs like hands and uh, uh, feet and so forth, they do reside within me and cause me harm as they like, as they desire. Although enemies, verse number 28 uh, says, although enemies such as hatred and craving have neither the arms and legs and then so forth. And for while they dwell within my mind at their pleasure, they cause me harm. Yet I patiently endure them to, without any anger. And, but this is an inappropriate and shameful time for patience. Should even all the gods and demigods rise up against me as my enemies, they could not lead nor place me in the roaring f of... They could not lead nor place me in the roaring fires and deepest hells. Yet the mighty foes, these disturbing emotions, 
conceptions in a moment can cast me amidst those flames, which, when met, will cause not even the ashes of the king of mountains to remain. And so it says all these enemies incapable of remaining for such a long time as can by disturbing emotions. The enduring enemy has neither beginning nor end. If I agreeably honor and trust myself to others, they will bring me benefit and happiness. But I entrust myself to these disturbing emotions and uh, in future they will bring only misery and harm. While in the cycling existence, how can I joyful, can be joyful and unafraid if my, in my heart I readily prepare a place for this incessant enemy of long duration. The soul calls for the increase of all of these harm that harms me. So these are uh, mentioning the faults of these negative emotions. And how shall I never ever have happiness if in a net of attachment within my mind there dwell the guardians of the pri prison of cyclic existence. These, their um, disturbing conceptions uh, that become my butchers and tormentors in hell. Therefore, as long as this enemy is not slain with certainty before my eyes, I shall never give up exerting my, uh, myself towards that end. Having become angry at someone who caused only slight and short-lived harm, shall uh, self-important people will not sleep until the enemies overcome. So verse number 43, and to do this will be my sole obsession. And so you make determination to fight these negative, uh, disturbing emotions. And holding a grudge, I shall meet them in battle. Yet, disturbing conceptions such as these, destroying, disturbing, destroy disturbing conceptions, and for the time being, are not to be abandoned. So it would be better for me to be burned, to have my head cut off, and to be killed, rather than ever bowing down to those ever-present disturbing emotions. And common enemies, when expelled from one country, simply retire and settle down in another. Though uh, when their strength is recovered, they then return. However, the way this enemy, my disturbing conceptions, is not similar to this in this respect, uh, diluted, disturbing emotions. Um, when forsaken by the eye of wisdom and dispelled from my mind, where will you go? Where will you dwell in order to be able to endure me again? Weakened mind, weak minded, I have been reduced to making no effort. If these disturbing conceptions do not exist within the objects, the sense organs between the two uh, or elsewhere and so forth, and the end of the fourth chapter. Chapter four is about conscientiousness. So you will determine that uh, that you will not let yourself be uh, taken astray by the negative emotions and do whatever is wholesome. And so on a daily basis, you should make the pledge that you will be a good person, that you will try to become a good person. And therefore, to do this is not uh, right, to do that is not right. And so when you do some, uh, when you are about to cause some harmful actions, harming others, uh, you should be mindful of yourself and also um, have this vigilant alertness. With those two, you should restrain yourself, harming others and um, cause, um, creating negative uh, karma. So unless you pay attention to with, with mindfulness and uh, conscientiousness, you will, uh, you will not be able to avoid doing the negative actions. And next is girding alertness. 
Those who wish to guard their practice should very attentively guard their minds, for those who do not guard their minds will be unable to guard their practice. In this world, unsubdued and crazed elephants are incapable, incapable of causing such harms as the miseries of the deepest hell, which can be caused by the unleashed elephant of my mind. However, if the elephant of my mind is firmly bound on all sides by the rope of mindfulness, all fears will cease to exist, and all virtues will come into my hand. Tigers, lions, elephants, bears, snakes, and all forms of enemies, the guardians of, all, of the hell worlds, evil spirits and cannibals will all be bound by binding my mind alone and will all be subdued by subduing my mind alone the perfect teacher himself has shown that in this way all fears as well as all boundless miseries origin from mind and so um, the, uh, the wrong things that we do actually ensue from our own unsubdued mind, unruly mind, and the good things that we achieve also come from our mind, who intentionally created all the weapons of those in hell, who created the burning iron, iron ground, uh, from where did all the women in hell and, and sh ensue. Um, the Mighty One has said that all things are the workings of negative mind, Hence, within the three worlds' spheres, there is nothing to fear other than my mind. So with regard to the secret of mind, with it, it refers to the emptiness of the mind. What? So first you should know what are right and wrong things and then show mindfulness um, to your practice and while you are engaging in your practice you should also watch from the uh, side of your mind uh, with uh, this guarding alertness whether you are uh, doing something wrong or not whether you are actually uh, being mindful of what you should do and or what you should avoid so the last year when i went to uh, when I went to uh, the Mun Arunachal Pradesh, one uh, BJP uh, Indian part, uh, political party, uh, BJP leader, accompanied me from uh, Guwahati, and so I uh, had a, um, a good time with him, and we became friends. And so one morning he came to see me and asked if, uh, how well I rested the, last, um, the previous night. And I said to him, I, slept, I sleep nine hours and then get up in the morning, early morning, and I do meditation for few, five, six hours. And therefore, uh, I could, you know, and I, then I do analysis of the nature of mind and so forth and in order to uh, sharpen my mind so that I could cheat others. And then this uh, political um, leader told me that he could only sleep six hours and therefore he cannot cheat others. So without this mind, um, guarding alertness or vigilance, um, you are not able to guard your mind, and so even though people may be learned, he says, I mean, because of lacking this girding alertness or vigilance, I mean, they uh, and also uh, the the wrongdoing, I mean, they, they in, uh, indulge in wrongdoings. So mindfulness and introspection are very important. 
For example, for the monks, the bhikshus should always think and reflect uh, on themselves that they are monks, that I am a bhikshu and should not do this and that. And so through that, you will be able to avoid the wrongdoings and going against your vows and precepts. So what are the requisites or the uh, conducive conditions for uh, the uh, alertness and uh, mindfulness to grow are those of relying on one's, um, uh, accompanying one's um, masters and so forth. So when you are mindful, I mean, you will be able to also uh, uh, develop this uh, introspection. So uh, so when you walk or go to some place, you should be mindful whether something uh, harmful is, um, I mean, um, uh, you, whether you are at some risk or not, do look to the right and left. And also, um, when there's no harm, you should um, ga place your gates downwards and so forth, as mentioned. So you should actually uh, bound your the um, elephant mind so that your mind is not um, does not go astray. So even though you may be able to focus your mind on a single I mean, single point or on an object. Uh, you should still check whether uh, dullness also, um, you know, falls uh, I mean, uh, uh, in your mind or not, which are uh, uh, like obstacles to developing single-pointed concentration. So when you want to um, go somewhere or talk about something, you should always be mindful and uh, show introspection. So now uh, the text goes through um, when just as I'm about to act, I see that my mind is tainted by defilement. At that, uh, such a time, I should remain unmovable like a piece of wood and so forth. Whenever there is attachment in my mind, verse number 48 and so forth. And whenever there is a desire to be angry, I should not do anything nor say anything, but remain like a piece of wood. Whenever I have distracted thoughts, I, the wish to verbally build others, feelings of self-importance or self-satisfaction, when I have the intention to describe the faults of others, pretensions and, and thought to deceive others, whenever I am eager to praise or have the desire to build, blame others, whenever it's and so forth. So the person and his or her body are different. 
when you say my body, you as the honor and you as the person are, I mean, as the honor and the body are different. So why confuse mind? Do you not hold only a clean wooden form, so forth? So verse number 62 says, first of all, mentally separates the layers of skin from the flesh and then with the scalp, uh, scalpel of discrimination, separate the flesh from the skeletal frame and so forth. And so these are taught to um, uh, counter the, uh, the attachment to one's body. And having split open, even the bones look right down into the marrow while examining this as yourself. Where is this its essence? If even when searching with such effort you can apprehend no essence, then why with so much attachment are you still guarding this body now? What use is this body to you if its dirty insights uh, are unfit for you to eat, if its blood uh, is not fit to drink, and if its in intestine are not fit to be sucked? At second best, it is only fit to be guarded in order to feed the vultures and jackals and so forth. So, His Holiness finished uh, verse number 69. Now, having paid my body its wages, I shall engage it in making my life meaningful. However, if my body is not of, ben of no benefit, then I shall give, not give it anything. So, because of being contaminated, this body, and because of uh, and, and, and biologically, we also have attachment and anger and so forth. You should uh, counter these attachments and anger and so forth. I should conceive of my body as a boat, a mirror, a mere support for my coming and going, and in order to benefit all others, transform it into the wish fulfilling body. And so you should turn yourself as friends of all sentient beings. Should not have any suspicion or doubt. Now, while there's freedom to act, I should always present my smiling face and cease to frown and look angry. I should be friend be a friend and counsel of the world. I should desire for from inconsiderately, I should desist from inconsiderately and noisily moving around chairs and so forth, as well as from violently opening doors. I should always be delightful in humility, the stork, the, the cat and the thief and so forth. With respect, I should gratefully accept unsought afterwards that are of benefit and wisely advise and admonish me. So to have peace of mind and happiness and joy within yourself, you can't buy it with uh, money, but you need to actually develop it from within your, I mean, within your mind. So I should discreetly talk about the good qualities of others and repeat those that others recount. If my own qualities are spoken about, I should just know and be aware that I have them. And so that you feel that you have actually lived the, uh, um, a day in a meaningful way. All deeds of others, verse number 77 says, all deeds of others are source of joy that would be rare even if it could be bought with money. Therefore, I should, I should be happy in finding this joy in the good things that are done by others. 
So through this, to doing this, I shall suffer no losses in this life, and in future lives shall I find great happiness. But and so you feel rejoiced. Um, but the fault of disliking the good qualities will make me unhappy and miserable. And the, in future lives, I shall find great suffering. So his Holiness just continued um, after 60, verse 69. When talking, I should speak from my heart on what is relevant, making the meaning of clear and Men clear in speech pleasing, I should not speak out of desire or hatred, but in gentle tones and in moderation, when beholding someone with my eyes, thinking I shall fully awaken through, depending upon this being, I should look at that person with love and an, an, an open heart. So verse number 81, finished, always be mo being motivated by great aspiration or being motivated by remedial forces. If I work in the fields of excellence, benefit and misery, great virtues will come about. So as I said before, when you, when you feel disturbed within your mind, you should read those of the chapter 6 and 8. So these are dedication verses that were recited by His Holiness.